Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Nick on School at Spring Shoots Virtual Talk Photography Show 2021. Um, glad you could join us here. My name's Neil Freeman from Nick on School. My colleague Rishi is here as well. We're going to be talking to you about how to shoot dramatic landscapes. Both myself and Rishi are landscape photographers. We also know lots and lots about Nikon kit, whether it's speed lights, lenses or cameras. So please get your questions into the chat area there. Rishi will be monitoring that and we'll be answering the questions as we go through. We've only got a short amount of time uh, today to go through this. So if we don't get through to your question, we apologise up front. However, what we do do, we have a number of sessions throughout the afternoon and even an after hours this evening, five through till six. So keep uh, visiting the different talks we've got today because we've got lots of chance to answer your questions. And if we don't do that, join us at Nikon School on the website. So check out Nikon School. We're doing lots of talks and we've got lots of workshops on there as well so have a look at the Nikon School website and see if there's anything on there that takes your fancy. A lot of the images I'm going to show that I've shot are actually from some of our workshops as well so delegates were next to me when we were shooting them so they've got these images as well because we were taking them through how to actually shoot all these sort of images. So and what I'm going to do now is share my screen and I'll start talking you through how to start shooting dramatic landscape images. Um, and before we go, Rishi, do we have any questions yet? Um, we did have one question that's already been asked, which is, okay. um, can you share some advice for shooting into the sun and also how you would handle exposure, especially when you're shooting at sunrise and sunsets? OK, I've got a lot of sunrise and sunset shots shooting into the sun. I will be talking about that. If I haven't answered that by the end of the session, please ask that again. But I hope to have covered that. It's almost like you've seen my presentation beforehand. OK, so um, we're going to talk about how to shoot dramatic landscape photography. One of the key things about uh, shooting landscape photography, especially dramatic landscape photography, is the light. A lot of these shots were planned before I even left my house or the hotel if we were on a workshop. So you've got to put a lot of planning in. We use photo pills or TPE, the Photographer's Amethyst app, to plan our shoot. I also use a lot of weather apps as well. Landscape photography, if you want dramatic light, which is what a lot of these shots come down to, you've got to understand weather and you've got to understand the time of year you're likely to get the sort of shots you want. OK, the sort of finish you then do on your image is entirely up to you. It's your look as a photographer. OK, so I shoot for me. OK. These are my images. I finish them with what are called basic darkroom techniques. So I do a bit of dodging and burning, light and areas, dark and areas. I'll then kick the colors a little bit. I'll then punch the contrast a little bit. My style as a photographer is not to shoot reality. I don't care about that. I can see it. I'm not interested in reproducing it. I have my style as a photographer and I shoot for myself, make myself happy. And I encourage you to do that. Shoot for yourself, make yourself happy when you're going up to shoot these images, okay? I had no interest in reproducing reality. One of my clients called this, this work hyper real. I don't do HDR, but I'm not shooting reality. It's somewhere in between, okay? And if you like the look, fantastic. If you don't like the look, fantastic as well. It's just not for you, okay? So I shoot for myself and I can talk through the editing process as well. I use Capture One now. Uh, capture one for Nikon. I'm getting better colors out of that. And I'm getting sharper images as well. So let's have a look at some of the images. If you want to follow along, a lot of these images are on the Nikon School UK website. They're also on my feed there, Nikon Neil UK and Nikon School UK. So if you want to follow us on Instagram, those are the accounts to have a look at. So let's talk about shooting. So as you can see here, I'm a huge fan of shooting wide, low and close is my technique. First thing when we're shooting landscapes, to get that immersive feel, first thing you can do to get that drama, part of the drama you can bring into your image is about one, good light, okay? So planning here, so we were up at four o'clock in the morning, drove to the location, we knew there was a chance of the sunset, sorry, sunrise coming out of the mountain, uh, valley, it's going to come up through here. I'm a huge fan of underlight. I'm not a big fan of having the sun in my picture. I will do that sometimes. I really go for the underlight on the shot. 
What I also do is because I've got no guarantee that the underlight is going to happen, I have a concept of having a foreground interest. And this is where wide angle lenses really come in, especially 14 mil. So if you're shooting on DX cameras, you could get something like a 10, 20, which gives you 15 to 30. That works really well as well. Low and close, what does that mean? That means my tripod is rarely above knee height. Sometimes it's at waist height, it is rarely at eye height. I strongly encourage if you want sort of to increase the drama in your photos, get low and then get close. I mean, close by this rock over the front here, I can lean over the front of my camera and touch it. That's how close it is, okay? So you've got to bear in mind the minimum focusing distance of your lens on this. And all of these shots are single pictures. None of these are composites, okay? So they've got a lot of movement in it. I can't be bothered blending and doing all that in Photoshop. And I use grads as well. Multiple ways of bringing the sky out. If you want to do luminosity masking, fantastic. If you want to do exposure blending, fantastic. I've shot from slide to film. I have field craft. I prefer field craft using grad filters, okay? And especially if you're going to go with the sun in the shot, Unless you're going to bracket an awful lot of pictures, which you can do if you want, and then blend them afterwards, which, again, can take time. You don't really know what you've got until you get back into your house or hotel and blend them all together. That's one way of doing it. I'm, I'm field craft, shoot it in camera, try and get it as close as I can to perfect in camera. And then I'm using grads. I strongly suggest sort of medium grads as well if you're going to go down that route with grads. We've got great dynamic range on the sensors here. And one of the things I'm a big fan of texture in my pictures. Now, we can do long exposure where we've got super smooth and sort of autumn, almost cotton wool water. Now, we'll do that sometimes if it's appropriate. But I find shooting low and close, wide as I can, OK, I'm focusing around the hyperfocal distance. So about bottom third of your picture. So this rock here, that rock there. OK, don't need to do focus stacking. If you focus correctly, you can get front to back sharpness in one shot if you're shooting at F8 or F11. OK, so these are all single shots here. So low and close, have a foreground and make sure you're on location early enough to get that good light. So this is an hour before sunrise. And then you can get that beautiful underlight as it comes up. Some days we don't need filters at all. We don't need, um, we don't need ND filters. There's just chance to get these painterly skies. And I, this is something that I do like. I will shoot a shot like this. I will then put my ND filter in and I will drift the clouds and I'll have a look. I generally, my style is to go for this sort of painterly effect where we've got this beautiful, again, we've got under light here. You can see the sun is just about to come up in here. Okay, and we've still got the under light on the clouds. Once the sun came up here and about 20 minutes later, we'd lost all of this beautiful texture. So again, big thing about getting there early. This is again, an hour before the sun is due to come up. We were on, on location and we were starting to shoot uh, as, as it went through. You can see there with the shots, again, I'm focused on the castle here. There's no real foreground as such. It's just about the light in the sky. Compositionally, you will find here, if you're working with dramatic light, and again, it comes down to light, you're working with good light, you can use things like rule of thirds composition. It doesn't have to be complicated. Simplify your scene. OK, you can quite easily see this is a castle at sunrise. Some days it will look like this. This was the following day, actually. And we've got a completely different shot. I strongly urge that you go back and reshoot the same location time and time again. The light is going to be different. Your composition then will be different. And the type of photo you will take will be different. Sometimes you get great skies. You get a sort of this sort of purpley blue. And again, we're waiting for the sun to come up. Sometimes we get this sort of sky. Fantastic. Two completely different shots. I'm pretty much standing in the same location. The following day, and this is all work, this is from our workshop in 2019. The following day, because all the delegates had seen this one day and not everybody was with us. Some people saw that the following day. Oh, fantastic. So all of the delegates came down with us on the last day and we got that. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. So you have to create the drama in your picture. And again, 
we come back to this sort of get out of jail car, uh, free card. We've got the opportunity if we have that foreground in the image there. So I've got leading lines being created by the rock pool. So we were shooting the previous shots off the beach here. Now we walk down to the rock pools. We've got the leading lines for the shot here. And we can see that the sun, it has come up somewhere in the world, but just not in Northumberland. So we've got this dark cloud. What can we do? We've got up really, really early in the morning. This again is another five o'clock start in the morning. It's very, very cold. So we need to be able to create our pictures. And this we're having sort of filters help. I've used Lee filters. And I'm currently shooting Nissi filters. So I use a 10 stop ND filter here. And with the 10 stop ND, it gives me that extended shutter speed. So I shoot in manual mode and that enables me to go beyond 30 seconds. If you're in aperture priority or shutter priority, you can't generally go beyond, well, you can't go beyond 30 seconds. So if you want that longer exposure time, go into manual mode and then go into bulb or time. I use time exposure on my Z7 II now, that has extended shutter speeds down to 900 seconds. So I don't even have to program that. I've just put a 60 second exposure in and that would be absolutely perfect for this. So here we are actually manufacturing the picture. The great thing about this is when you get on location, whether you've got good dramatic light or whether you're working to create a picture, visualize it. You're looking at this thinking, oh, there's no clouds. But if I put a grad on the sky, I can get some texture. Okay, great. If I now get my ND out, I can make the, the sea go misty and I can drift some of that texture in the cloud. And you can start to think about how your shot starts to come together. Again, focus third of the way in here and we get that front to back sharpness at F8 here. 1.2 medium grad because I, I like dark stormy skies. I have a 0.9 medium grad as well. They're the only two that I actually carry around. 10 stop ND here as well as you can see i'm on my 14 mil lens at 14 mil low and close again shot about knee height with the tripod here which gives you that extended leading line going into the shot this is at iceland vestraholm one of my favorite places to shoot stunning location as well again we're looking at the light. Light can add a huge amount of drama. And this particular one, unlike the previous shots, I'm shooting away from the sunrise, okay? Sunrise is coming up behind me. I'm looking at the Alpenglow effectively. What's happening 180 degrees. The guy that taught me photography many, many years ago always used to say to me, sometimes your best shot is behind you. And that is so true. Yes, the sun is coming out of the sea behind us and going into cloud banks, and it's it, it was all right. If you turn round, you could see it catching the mountain. Well, it didn't actually catch the mountain on this particular day. It did the other the, the following day, but got a whole range of shots here. So looking at the drama, wander around, because where we park the cars over here, unless you walk around, you can't see this reflection. You've got to go and scout your locations. So again, this comes back to visualizing your photo. My kit does not come out my bag until I've wandered around and I've seen three or four spots where I can actually shoot from. So that makes it easy for me to think about, right, I've got one location, now I'm gonna go over there. And as I'm wandering around visualizing how I'm gonna pull these pictures together, I can start to see different shots. I'm looking at the light changing as well. If the light is fantastic there straight away, and I've, as soon as I've found a great location, I will start shooting and then do my scouting a bit later. But generally, I get there early enough to do my scout around so I can then, as the light starts to change and we start to work with really, really nice dramatic lighting, we can actually then sort of move quickly and get to our other location spots we've seen because we've already scouted them out. Again, very low here. I'm very low to the ground. The tripod I have is a Photo Pro T85. It doesn't have a center column in it. So I can actually put it flat on the ground if I need to. And I can be a couple of inches off the ground. And it gives me that low look here, really sort of emphasizes the reflection in the shot. From a composition perspective, I'm always looking for leading lines, reflections, and um, sort of rule of thirds if I've got great painterly skies. Those things tend to work. Simplify your composition as well. Don't put 
too much into your picture. Then you can let the light build the drama around the shot. This is Snowdonia. As you can see here, you've got great textures here. You can look at the dynamic range on the sensor there, and you've got the subtleties between the deep black, and then you've got the various shades of gray going into the Snowdonia horseshoe here. Again, fantastic sky. It had been really iffy weather all day. It had actually been sort of raining and things like that. And again, coming back to knowing your weather systems, especially in the national parks in the UK, one of the things is if, if the day does break after a rainstorm, you are normally in for sometimes a really, really good sunset. So we went to the location. There was no guarantee we were going to get there. I've been to more failed sunrises and sunsets. The sun was going down behind the mountain. And this particular one, until the sun went down into the cloud banks, this was almost unshootable, even with gradient filters on the sky. OK, so if you're going to shoot the sun in the sky, you can bracket if you want, but you're going to have to do a lot of them because the dynamic range in a shot like that is huge. I still prefer to use grads in that situation because I know what I've got at point of capture. What I'll then do in post-processing when I finish the picture is I will use software grads as well. And I will use the light, the shadows, open up the shadows, bring back the highlights to manage the dynamic range in that shot. If you're shooting things like a D850, Z7, Z7 Z6, you've got a very, very wide dynamic range to play with. So you can bring up shadows, but don't bring them up too far because you will introduce noise and you can pull back highlights. And again, but don't go too, too far over because you'll lose the highlights as well. The technique I tend to shoot for is ETTR, exposed to the right. That gives me, so I'm slightly overexposing the shot with a view to pulling it back. With the way sensors capture detail, that means I'm getting the maximum out of the sensor. But when I say I'm exposing to the right, so slightly overexposing, I'm talking about probably two thirds uh, to one, one stop over maximum. But I am taking a guide to the histogram. Bear in mind, the histogram on the back of your camera is a JPEG histogram. It's showing the histogram from the JPEG on your camera. Your raw histogram is wider. So you have to have a bit of an understanding about what's going on with your camera as well. So the other thing here, the deliberate reason to go to Silhouette here as well, is there is a campsite on here. And there is a random assortment of cars, vans, trucks, and all sorts of stuff. To see this in reality, it looks a mess. But let's come back to our visual, visualization of our picture. We can look at the scene. And again, Ansel Adams, huge fan of Ansel Adams. And he had the concept to visualize your picture on your, on your wall and then work back. These days, we visualize our picture on social media. Or if we're into printing, we can visualize it as a print. So what I'm looking at when I'm setting up this scene is I can see a campsite, but I can see some beautiful light going on as well. It's really going to have this backlit drama. We're going to get these purples. We're going to get this under light coming down at sunset here. I can make that work with my gradient filter, but I'm looking at the campsite saying I've got some options here. I can one, Photoshop all the cars out if I want or clone them out. Don't know whether I have time to do all that. Or if I actually underexpose that part of the frame, I can look to and deliberately not bring the shadows up in post-process. They pretty much go away anyway. So we've got options. Visualize how you think the shot's going to work for you. Look at the scene and think, right, I've got a lot of Photoshop work to be doing on this or not. Or we could actually think about using our gradient filter here to equalize the exposure and then just in post-process, not lift the shadows. There is a place for long lenses. I carry my Z7 II. I've got my 14 to 24 f 2.8, just upgraded to that from the 1430 f4, which is a brilliant lens. I've gone to the 1424 f2.8 to do a bit of astrophotography as well. That just gives me a little bit more sort of uh, scope for my astrophotography. I carry a 2470 f2.8, and I've recently added to the collection, I had the 24 to 200 f4 to 6.3, lovely lightweight setup. But because I have the other f2.8 lenses, I also do a bit of wildlife photography where I'm out and about shooting landscapes. I've got the 7200 f2.8 now. And for landscapes, there is a place for long lens photography. 
especially if you've got scenes where you want to pull everything together, you want to compress everything. Dark Hedges here in Antrim works perfectly like this. This does not work as a wide angle shot. These trees are actually spaced really far apart if you've been here. This sort of thing works brilliantly with your 70 to 200. Now I'm carrying it around a lot. It's, a, it's not the lightest lens in the world to carry around, but it doubles up for the five or six occasions throughout the year where I'm gonna shoot things like this, or if I've got rolling hills and I wanna bring them together, shooting at 200 or 300 mil really makes that shot come alive cliffs on coastline photography as well sort of sea cliffs you want to pull them together shooting at a longer lens works brilliantly okay so there is a place in your bag and and for sort of if you really want to add that drama to shots like this because this doesn't work with a wide angle lens even mid-range telephoto it loses the emphasis the drama on this particular shot we've added by actually toning this in uh, in capture one so what i've done here i've actually done we call it split toning back in the day so i've gone for we've toned the highlights we've toned the shadows so i pulled it up and i'm going for very much the game of thrones sort of look for the shot so that was my inspiration for the color tone on this particular one this actually if you see the original it was a flat gray horrid day so sometimes the drama we can add to our pictures we actually do in post. If we haven't got the light we want to work with, and I've been here a number of times and I've still not yet got brilliant light shafts coming through the trees and things like that. And I will keep going back until I get that shot. Here for this sort of thing though, it doesn't matter that we had a flat gray day. What we can do here is we can create that drama using post-processing. Here's a shot the other day, and this was again another day where it was absolutely rubbish during the day, clouds everywhere, horrible, and on my way home to where I live from where I was shooting, I have to go past here, it's called Windskill Stones up in the Yorkshire Dales, and it's a great place for sunset. So one of the things we do here, I took the off chance of, I could see the clouds were starting to break, and there's always a good chance that there was, the sun was going to drop out the clouds, and I know that if I catch the sun between cloud banks, I've got a good chance of shooting a sunburst. Now, normally what you would do with your camera settings to get a sunburst is you have to shoot at F18, F22, F29. But because you've now gone above F16, you've got diffraction. So even though you've got your starburst on the sun, your shot will actually start to get softer because you've got diffraction going on. On high megapixel cameras now, we do not shoot beyond probably F14, F11 sometimes even. So we don't need these days to shoot beyond F14. Yes, your depth of field gets bigger, but you start introducing diffraction, so the overall image is softer. So we keep our F-stop F14 and lower, okay? So on what I've noticed now on the new S series lenses, especially this 1424 S, I can actually now achieve starburst at my normal aperture. So I get the best of both worlds. I get the sweet spot for the aperture, everything is sharp, and I still get great starbursts on here. I've got a 0.9 grad on here. It's a glass grad as well. It's very, very clean. One of the things if you're going to use grads and you're gonna shoot into the sun, you have to make sure the front of your lens is super clean and the grads, if you're gonna use them, are clean as well. Because any smudges, dirt, fingerprints on those is going to create lens flare or sort of hot spots on your lens where you just don't want that, especially if you're shooting into the sun. So here, we've got a gradient filter on the sky to pull that down, okay? I've then further finished this in post with a software grad as well, just to, just to finesse the highlights and shadows in the sky as well. And we've shot there at the, the f-stop there to give me the depth of field front to back. And I'm focused, front edge here, I'm just focused on this rock here, gives me the front to back sharpness. This level of light lasted for about 10 minutes. We then went into a whole sequence of underlight on the sky. So that again, there's a whole sequence here. So this opportunity here, which was, oh, this might happen when I was actually driving the car, go up there and park up, set myself up. If nothing happened, nothing happened. But actually, I then spent the next hour shooting a whole sequence of great pictures. But I've done that before. 
and I've not got anything or, or nothing as dramatic with the light. But again, if you've got your 10 stop filters, you've got your grads, you can make something of the scene. We could have drifted these clouds if the sun hadn't broken through and gone for a much more atmospheric, dramatic, stormy look if we wanted to do that. Again, shooting into the sun here, this is Northumbria. So shooting into the sun here, I'm trying to keep the sun as it's coming up. What I tend to try and do is I can get the sun in a cloud bank. It makes my life easier to shoot. We've got our 0.9 medium grads here. I don't have any other filters on at all. There was no need, there's no real movement in here. I love the painterly sky in it. I didn't want to drift that. The other reason was I was chasing the light here. I got caught on the A1 in a traffic jam outside Newcastle and it, it made me late. I lost about 20 minutes and I lost the best light. That really frustrating thing when you're driving to your location and you're watching the sky and it's on fire and you're stuck in the car knowing that you've got to park the car, get your gear out and then get to the location, which was about six, seven minutes from where I was parking. So chasing the light here. One of those things is how quickly can you get, go through this practice? How quickly can you go from your kit in your bag to fully deployed with your sort of grad filters in front and focus? Practice that because if you practice that setting, I know I can go from setup, uh, from bag to setup in probably about a minute. Okay, very, very quick visualization of your shot. So as I was driving in, I'm thinking sky 0.9 grad to bring the sky down. Help me shoot directly into the sun. I'm going to focus a third of the way in. I know my style. So I know that I'm going to shoot a tripod is going to be set up about knee height. OK, so I'm already knowing as I'm pulling my gear out, I'm thinking, right, I'm going to go vertical here because I've got this great leading line and shape in the foreground. I'm going to go vertical. I shoot with an L bracket on my camera, a three legged thing, L bracket, uh, Zelda L bracket. That makes going vertical on my camera dead, dead simple. The weight is still through the center column, okay? Focus third of the way in here. And then I know my settings, ISO 64, because that's the highest dynamic range my particular camera is going to give me because I'm on a tripod. I've got my F8, that's gonna be front to back sharpness. And I know that I don't want any movement in the shot. So I don't even need to get my ND filters out. That is going through my head as I'm driving to my location. So visualizing your shot lets you know what gear you actually want to get out of your bag. Let's have a look at Vestrahorn. This is what I was saying about go back to your location. One day it looked like this. We went back a week later on a different tour. It now looks like this. That water has frozen. The volcanic sand has come up through cracks in the water and I've got a stunning leading line going into it. So again, I'm pretty much low, close. I can touch this sand if I wanted, reach over and touch the sand, low and close. Again, focused on a part of the sand about here. OK, and again, using my medium grad, not a lot in the sky to bring out, but enough just to give that little bit of texture. Let's jump back to Snowdonia. And that was another one of those sequences. This is how this ended up. So we went from this into this. And it was just terrific to watch the sky light up like this. These are rare when you get days like this. But when you get them, you need to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. OK, and I'm deliberately now letting everything go to shadow because I love the way the light was coming down. And we just had this little light in the foreground, just picking up the foreground. It was just terrific with the way the underlight worked on the sky. So, again, having the grads on the sky here really, really helps. And sometimes drama can be created by the clouds and 1.2 medium. Was it this stormy? Was it this sort of menacing? It, we got wet. OK, uh, there was a storm here. Was it as menacing as this when we looked at it in reality? No, but by shooting with my 1.2 medium grad on the sky, I can make the sky really, really dark. I can give that emphasis. I can give that drama to the storm. So thinking about sort of capturing that detail. And again, that's why I shoot with the grad. If, if here we've got a highlight, here, even with a 1.2 grad, I can't bring back this. We have the sun breaking through and such a range of dynamic range here. Okay. Sometimes you just won't be able to capture it or even if you bracketed this and this storm is rolling through really, really quickly. So even if you bracketed it, you can have ghosting and all sorts of problems with it. So it's easier to shoot it with a gradient filter 
you know you've got that there and then, and then we can use further finesse this with a software grad in post-process if we want. And the way the light was coming through, clipping the house down here, rule of thirds on the house here, and then we've got the sort of length here as well. I did swap up to my 200 mil. There are other shots where this is all compressed together and the sort of uh, clouds are moving down the valley at the time, but I love the longer view into the, the valley here in, uh, so this is just outside of Lamberis. If you've not been to Iceland, I strongly suggest you go. We've got three tours running in December, January, uh, uh, December and January. I think they're pretty much sold out, but we're looking at doing another one in February as well. If you've not been there yet, you should go and go on a photographic trip. We, we, we run them. We take a number of, uh, we only have a small number of delegates and two professional photographers go. So we get a lot of time with you. These sort of things here, the weather you get in Iceland. So here we've got a sunset. And I've waited for the sun to go into the clouds, so it makes my exposure easier. Gradient filter to bring out the detail in the clouds, further finesse that with a software grad as well. These sort of shots here where you see this movement on the waves, this is with the waves pulling backwards, okay? The trick here is let the wave come in, break, and then you start your exposure as it pulls backwards. This is the Iron Islands in Antrim. Uh, for a Game of Thrones fan, this is um, Iron Islands is actually um, Balantoy Harbour is what it's called in reality. And again here, 10 stop filter using here just to drift back, simplify your composition as well. With the 10 stop there, I get the drama of the moving skies and the misty sea, and we're building it around a very, very colorful rock stack. Ice caves, if you've ever had a chance to photograph ice caves, you don't actually have to do a lot. They are dramatic in their own right. Look at that texture there. This is what I call a high clarity picture. You can punch the clarity of the shot way up. You can punch the sharpening way up. The texture and the drama you get from uh, just being in an ice cave is just incredible. Just watch your highlights and your dynamic range on this shot because they, the, the dynamic range in an ice cave is enormous. Panoramas have the option of being very, very dramatic. This is a single shot from a 45 megapixel camera that I've just cropped the top and bottom off of. I don't do, yes, I have a proper pano head. Uh, I generally use that for multi-stage panos, but if I'm doing something like this, so this is Snowdonia range from Anglesey looking across the Menai Strait. I'm just looking at a single shot, crop the top and bottom off. So that good. I've still got a huge file to work with here. Low and close, I have a chamois cloth draped over the top of my camera. Yes, the weather ceiling my Nikon is brilliant, but I've got, I, I don't want to protect the camera as well. So I have a chamois cloth as a cover for my camera. Enables me to just roll it back, get to the dials, roll it back forward, and then cover the camera up. Worked brilliantly as a cover for my camera. Low and close, I'm constantly cleaning the front of the uh, filter off because it's getting a little bit of spray for the water because I am that close. But again, this is one of those mornings where you look at it and you think, oh, it's foggy, there's nothing going on. No, go out, there's always a shot to be found. Fog in the mountains and the national parks and the low cloud. Yeah, it might not look anything, but there's something once you go and add a foreground to it that really, really brings your picture alive. Sunset here, uh, sun is going down camera right. I deliberately not included it because it was giving us, um, I love the backlight, the underlight here. So the sun in this shot was actually pretty much down by the time we got to the location and we were aiming at just trying to catch some of this underlight on the cloud. So underlight is probably easier to shoot. And then I'm using my three stop ND here to get this, what I call firework waves, little texture in the water. I really love that, that's my go-to type of shot. I do have a 10 stop version of this, uh, which gave me three minute 15 exposure, where the water is completely flat and the sky is drifting. I prefer this version, I still like the other one, but I prefer this one, low and close as well on the shot here. Again, this typical example here of wave pulling backwards. Okay, so the wave has broken, and we're now letting it go back. I can actually touch this rock low and close, get immersive, 
shoot wide, shoot low, shoot close. There's not a lot of tricks to this. This location, I've been up here four or five times and I still don't have the shot I want. When you start the walk from the road down here, the sky always looks so promising. And then when you get up here, every single time it's cleared and the sky, the plan, the visualization of this shot is for the sky to be on fire and everything to be really, really sort of, sort of, sort of just brilliant and the light catching the land and all that sort of stuff. This one's all right. We've got the sun going down. It's catching tri-fan there which is okay. We've got the foreground, which is our, our sort of plan B for the sky not actually working. So think about when you're shooting these sort of images, if you want, still want the, the drama for the shot, think about actually giving yourself a foreground, just not relying on the sky to do all the work for you. Because a lot of the time it doesn't work out, but with the foreground there, it doesn't always matter that your, your sky hasn't worked out on this shot. Black and white, black and white can add drama to your shot as well. This was a very monochromatic day, okay? Didn't this shot um, in color is just rubbish, okay? Turn it to black and white, suddenly it comes alive. Now I like high contrast black and white. That's my style as well. So what I'm doing here, going back to how we used to do with red filters on the cameras and things like that, this sort of shot here, putting a lot of contrast in. This is created on multiple layers um, in Capture One. So I've got various layers here and I'm addressing various bits. I'm using brushes here to really emphasize where I want you to look and bring out the texture and detail. Again, black and white here, we can go very high clarity if we want on certainly shots with rocks on there. But have a look for the clouds. Sometimes these days like this just don't work in color, thinking black and white. Astrophotography by its nature is dramatic. This is just a single shot in Snowdonia taken in October, just between the lockdown breaks. One of the few pictures I actually took last year. So this was on a workshop. Single picture, that's how good the dynamic range is on the Z6, Z7. We can pull out that amount of detail in post-process. Appreciate it's not the galactic core. It wasn't galactic core time of the year. This was Galactic Core time of the year, single shot as well. This is in Devon, north coast of Devon. We've got a course going on down here in June, hopefully. Um, now locked down as ease, which was postponed from last year. Single photo as well. And we can just get drama like that from our shots. So if you haven't tried astrophotography, it is actually really, really simple. This is just a camera on a tripod with a wide angle lens. It's very, very easy to do. Northern Lights, again, are simple to do as well. We've got here um, Kirchhoffel in on the Snaefulness Peninsula. We've got the foreground interest there because we didn't know that, the North, well, actually, we did know the Northern Lights were happening because we'd spent a little while in the car park shooting it. But what we didn't know was if we wanted the 10 minutes it takes to get to this location, if the Northern Lights would still be on the sky. And when we got around to the location with the delegates, this, it was still there. So we started shooting it. These are the higher waterfalls. There is a lower waterfall below this, but in the dark, minus 15, covered in ice. Um, that's too much health and safety paperwork if something was to go wrong. So we shot this from the higher waterfall and it just worked brilliantly. And again, proper night chasing the Northern Lights. We then had this down at the Bidur Church. Some scenes just look dramatic. There's not a lot you need to do. All you need to have is the ability to know the correct shutter speeds to just record them and then how to pull that detail out in post. And that's really it. A few dramatic landscape shots there. Rishi, do we have any questions at all? We have, we have loads of questions. I think you've answered a lot of them as you've gone. Um, what I would say is I'm gonna fire some quick fire questions at you. Cool. Um, some more yes and no stuff. If we don't answer every question, cause we probably won't in the time we have left. Um, we have a, a clinic that's um, in, a, in an hour or so. So you can join that and ask any questions in there. Um, so a couple of quick fire questions at you. Do you light your foregrounds with artificial uh, lighting? No, I don't. Okay. Um, do you use a grad filter and an ND together? Yes, I do all the time. Would you would you choose a twenty four to two hundred or the F mount seventy to two hundred F four um, on an FTZ? Oh, uh, twenty four to two hundred is sharper. What are your um, thoughts on that? Um, if you're using the um, grad filter tool in post processing, would you mask out other subjects such as trees? Sometimes that's very image dependent. 
Um, a couple of questions about diffraction. So just clarifying diffraction. Um, obviously, diffraction starts to kick in from f11 on high megapixel cameras, and it can also start to kick in from f14 on lower megapixel cameras. I would suggest you do some testing with the own camera that you have, but keep in mind that if you're shooting at f18, f22, you will get softer results. We don't recommend shooting that high. Um, do you use a remote release? No, I don't. I use exposure delay mode in the camera. Most cameras, if you go into the custom settings menu, you have something called exposure delay mode. Set that to two or three se or three seconds now and just use that. So that's all from my 850 days uh, now into my mirrorless days as well. What L bracket would you recommend for a Z6? Z6, you want the Zelda from three-legged thing. Um, let's just have a quick look. Um, did you mention... Do you shoot black and white in camera or change it in post? I personally shoot it, uh, I change it in post. Rishi, you? I shoot in camera, so there's not a wrong or right. <laughs> um, how do you decide between using a 0.3 or a 0.9 grad? Um, how much, so how dark do I want the sky? It's as simple as that. Um, that's the thing, we get asked a lot of the time about um, sort of, uh, which is the right grad to use that's sort of the wrong question ask yourself how dark do you like your skies if you like stormy skies do a 0.9 or a 1.2 if you don't like stormy skies use a 0.6 or a 0.3 it come at it from that way and that opens up a, a whole new way of looking at it um i've got the z mount 24 to 70 and um 70 to 200 would the 14 to 30 be a great addition to that yes Yep. Do you shoot through the screen or the viewfinder when you're shooting low? Um, through the screen, always. My back now does not let me move into those positions <laughs> that I, I need to. Rishi's significantly younger than I am, so he can still lay on the floor, but even you use the screen now. So, um, yeah, uh, tilt screens, um, sort of D800, D810 that didn't have them. When I got onto sort of shooting the 850, that was just oh, amazing. Um, and do you shoot, what white balance do you shoot? Do you use a temperature preset or do you adjust it in post? Right, so I shoot auto white balance and then I will, because I'm shooting 14 bit raw, I adjust that in post. So we've got lots of other questions, but I'm conscious of running out of time. So if there's any other questions that we've not answered, then join our session in an hour or so, which is our clinic where you can ask any questions that you have in there as well. So I feel like we should end there before we get cut off. <laughs> yeah, okay. Cheers for that, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, we'll see you in an hour. Come and join our clinic. Uh, we've got, it's, um, again, 40 minutes, and we're just answering your questions. So if you actually, you can post the questions in the chat area before, um, before it starts. So just copy and paste your questions across. And if you've got your questions up there at the top of the pile, we'll, we'll definitely get to them. Okay, see you soon, everybody. Thank you for watching. Cheers. Bye.